Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Wild Neighbor Speaker Series. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jaya Torres, and I'm the interpretive guide with Travis County Natural Resources. This webinar is a series, this webinar series is a collaboration that we do with Travis County and the City of Austin, and who both co-manage the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve, as well as other public and private partners. The BCP is one of the nation's largest urban preserves, covering more than 33,000 acres. It's made up of more than 140 individual tracks managed by both public and private partners. The BCP was created in 1996 and continues to protect habitat for seven endangered species and other species of concern found on the preserve. Today for our Wild Neighbor Speaker Series, we're excited to have Todd Jackson, Jackson environmental scientist with the City of Austin's Watershed Protection Department. Todd will give us a brief introduction to benthic macroinvertebrates, where they live, why they live there, and along with some super cool photos of what they look like under high magnification. Hello, uh, I am Todd Jackson. I'm a biologist, City of Austin, Watershed Protection Department. Our division is currently changing names because it's a reorganization, but we're, we are essentially applied watershed research. Um, I usually kind of summarize that by saying we're the creek and river doctors. So we go around, we find things, we figure out what the things are, and then uh, kind of solve weird problems. Um, but today I'm going to focus on just one of those. So everybody on my team kind of has a superpower. I'm the bugs guy. Okay, so today I'm going to focus on that one aspect of what we do, which is biological monitoring. There's a whole suite of things we look at in our streams um to protect the chemical physical and biological integrity of austin's creeks and reservoirs and other wetlands um that can range from investigating fish kills dog killing algae uh e coli problems uh ecosystem complexity riparian systems but essentially you know we want to ensure that we continue to live in a city that has a living world around it so uh that's essentially what we're doing in, in like bigger picture. One of the big flagship projects is the Environmental Integrity Index and the Austin Lakes Index. And both of those indices are scored uh, with a combination of physical habitat surveys, uh, riparian uh, vegetation surveys, benthic macroinvertebrates, which y'all that's just everything slimy and crunchy under our feet, um, uh, algae and diatoms, uh, and then like a lot of physical things like uh, flow measurements and uh, water chemistry, E. coli, nutrients, and all of these things kind of tie together into formulas that help us generate overall scores. Uh, for the last 25 years, we've been sampling uh, roughly 50. I think now we're at like 58 named watersheds. If there's a named creek near you in this area, we probably sample it. These yellow dots represent nodes where we've been collecting benthic stream macroinvertebrates. And uh, really what they do is give us kind of a window into all of this area that you see here. So all those incoming tributaries and ephemeral streams, we hope to capture with these nodes. And these nodes are kind of significant uh, points where larger streams come together or outflow into another stream. Um, and uh, over our area, we you see like, we kind of have um, a variety of urban stream systems. And I like this picture because this shows like reality in the city. Uh, in the top three windows, we have um, kind of somewhat healthy for urban systems. If you, if you look at the top row, you've got, I guess the top left here, this is a uh, Waller Creek. Um, I think that's near Epoch Coffee. On the left side, you have a completely scoured streamscape, but on the right side, you see it's vegetated and stable. Um, in the middle top and in the top right, I think those are both Shoal Creek, uh, you actually have a fairly intact um, stream bed. And uh, if you look at the bottom, there's a few things to note here. One, the, the very sad looking photo here in the uh, bottom center, that's... Uh, um, Lower Waller Creek, and this is a huge snapping turtle uh, hanging out below Ironworks. I think the turtle is very happy where it is because people throw it bones, but um, but you can see that stream riprap, not the natural condition. We don't see a lot of other countable life there. And then in the bottom right, this is another typical thing in urban watersheds. We see disjunct or discontinuous habitat. So, you know, if I'm a fish, 
Uh, you know, one of the first things is I tell this to fifth graders, what's the first thing a water animal needs to be alive? It needs water. Uh, if there's not water for even one day of the year and that's the area you live, that's bad. It's just like if I took all of you to space and on the first day in space, I gave you no oxygen, but the rest of the year, I give you all the air you wanted. You'll look just as bad on day 365, whether I took away air only on the first day or if you had none the whole time. So these habitat um, discontinuities sometimes disrupt living systems. And this box culvert's a really good example. It also can prevent um, e-migration and immigration of animals from one stream, stream segment, segment to another. Uh, in the bottom right here, I think that's Waller Creek at Shite Park. Um, while people perceive this as real beautiful, and there's, you know, if you can think of places on the green belt where um, there's, uh, you know, all of these scoured limestone outcrops look beautiful, but they are actually representative of the disturbed condition where all of the sediment and um, gravel and sand and cobble is gone. There's nowhere to live. So even if the water quality is great, if there's nowhere to live or and nothing to eat, then, uh, you know, you you also have problems. But these are pretty typical of a range of conditions we see in the city. Um, you know, compared to here, this is actually, this might be up on one of the BCP preserves. This is uh, one of the upper tributaries of Bull Creek, and this is a natural stream ripple. We like to have a good comparison. Um, and here, when I say stream riffle, if y'all are not familiar, it's usually an area where the slope is going down rapidly. The water flows over a bunch of rocks and it's kind of aerated. It's the parts of the creek where you can hear what's happening. Um, so it, it's also where a lot of gas exchange is occurring. It's where the most metabolism occurs. It tends to be the best habitat to sample because it's just full of life. Um, and uh, these uh, the these ripples are the habitats that we like to survey for our biomonitoring because we want to sample the same habitat each time. We don't want to see the difference between a pond and a pool and uh, a deep part of a river and a riffle. We want to sample riffles every time so that we can look for changes that are caused for thing by things other than natural changes. We're looking for degradation of water quality, sewage spills. Uh, metals contamination, sediment pollution, and changes to hydrology, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but here's one of our crews out sampling. It looks like they're having a blast. Um, we typically use a device called a server, which you can see here in the top right, um, a, as opposed to kick nets. And a lot of agencies use a variety of trap types. We like the server because what you can see here is my supervisor, Andrew Clemon, uh, stirring, he is sampling a defined area. And we really like quantitative over qualitative sampling. You know, it's nice to say, gosh, we went to the site and there were some salamanders and I saw a turtle and oh, it's so pretty. And that's great, but that's hard to replicate. And um, instead, we like to have a defined sample area where I can say, I found this many of these types of aquatic beetles within one square meter. You know, and we can also look at densities. Uh, another reason that servers are nice and why we choose to sample invertebrates, and I think actually that's probably my next slide, yeah, is the overall abundance and diversity of life you encounter. And here, what you see is almost every ecosystem niche filled. And I think 90% of these are my own photos from Austin Streams. There may be one or two. So these are all, and these are each species you do find here. Um, you know, if I wanted to go and sample, uh, look for pollution in turtles, I could. I love finding turtles. It's really fun. Um, but if I was to throw my my net out at random, because sampling must be random if you want to ascertain patterns in any system, it, if I randomly threw out my net, I mean, how often do you think I would randomly be like, oh, wow, a turtle <laughs> with a net? You could look for them. But your sample size would be small. And I don't know if y'all can see me on camera right now or not. But when sample size is small, mathematically speaking, chaos inherent in the universe is large. Uh, and when chaos inherent in the universe is large, you get a lot of what we call statistical noise. I can't tell if I'm seeing differences due to 
random chaos inherent in the universe or a real non-random reason that something is different or that, you know, Barton Creek is different from Waller Creek. But with server samples collecting benthic macroinvertebrates, I get them every single time. And we can get them in numbers ranging from 200 to 2,000 in just a one square foot server net. Uh, so they are abundant and they fill all of these different ecosystem niches and they give us a huge sample size. And when sample size is, um, sorry, sample size was small with the turtles. When sample size is large, random chaos inherent in the universe shrinks. And sorry, it looks like my light's going out. I apologize, I'm out of focus. But uh, ran when random chaos inherent in the universe is small, I can see meaningful differences. And then I can say, this spot on Waller Creek is definitively less ecologically complex than this other spot on Upper Barton Creek or Bear Creek. And when I can say that, then I can start to form hypotheses and say, well, why? Why is it different? And um, each of these things in here, it's it's like you could, these each fill uh, the roles of like, think of every animal you could find on an East African savanna. The trophic webs of just one small lake or pond are incredibly complex. And by the way, I always highlight this one here. So you, the, I, hopefully y'all are seeing this with all the lines. Each dot represents an organism and how it is trophically linked to others. It either is eaten or eats that. And over here, the fun one is the um, smallmouth bass has one line that like links to itself. And that's because big ones eat little ones. So yikes, it's cannibal. Um, but uh, these other organisms in here at the lowest level, first trophic levels, you're seeing things like phytoplankton, which are photosynthesizing plankters. And then your second trophic level will be things like very T90 crustaceans and zooplankters. And then after that, you have lots of things feeding on them and it kind of spirals up to these higher level carnivores and some real fancy parasites up here that have some kind of interesting roles. Oh, here's another cannibal. I don't even know what species that one is. But uh, this food web gives you an idea of how intricate it is. And if we can look at that, then we can understand complexity in the system pretty well. So I, I can look at changes in predators, parasites, uh, herbivores, et cetera. And with um, invertebrates, we also have some other, like we would break down things like herbivore and detritivore a little more uh, here we've got a like a feeding guild called a scraper, and I don't know if y'all have seen these before or not. This is actually the underside, which is way cooler, but it's a, called a water penny. It's a beetle larva that's super common. Uh, if you ever swim down at Barton Springs or go hiking in Bull Creek, you find them everywhere. It's a uh, Cephidus texanus, and it just cruises around under there scraping algae, like uh, just scraping primary production algae off of rocks. Uh, so kind of a um, just sort of um, buffing the rocks for algae and diatoms. Uh, to the left of it here, we have what's called a shredder. This is also one of the most common invertebrates we collect out here. It's a crustacean. Um, and in this crustacean is an amphipod. So you have several different, like, I guess we would say shrimp-like things, um, you know, crayfish. We actually do have a few types of river shrimp and then amphipods and isopods. Um, some people call these scuds. This one is Hyalella. We used to call it Hyalella Azteca, and then we found out that species is restricted to an area around Veracruz. So this one in our area is probably an undescribed species, but in the genus Hyalella. And it what shredders like to break down what we call all lactinous input into a stream. So every fall, these trees lose leaves. Why doesn't all that nitrogen and phosphorus just dump into the gulf every year? Well, it's because of something we call nutrient spiraling. And when those leaves fall in, in the, especially in headwaters in the most upstream areas, when the leaves fall in, they tend to, um, they, they get uh, colonized by microorganisms. And I always call it the peanut butter. I'm gonna try to make this analogy, what shredders are really eating. Um, they are not necessarily eating the leaves themselves. They're eating this sort of, organic ooze that forms over those leaves once they've been submerged for a few months. And the analogy I make is, or my professor, my major professor used to make was, um, imagine if it's like there was some catast 
catastrophe and all you've got to eat 10 years from now is saltine crackers and they're super stale and gross. I mean, you could eat it and live on it, but you wouldn't really be thriving. Um, but then you find like a jar of peanut butter and you put it on there. The peanut butter is actually what's going to give you the nutrients. The saltine crackers you could live on, but you wouldn't exactly have the best nutrition after two years of eating that. In this case, the shredders are taking these low nutrient degrading leaves that fall in each year which do have carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus it's just usually locked up in cellulose and lignans and other things but the shredders are eating the peanut butter that's on top of those leaves and it's a combination of um uh you know aquatic molds and bacteria and aquatic fungi aquatic uh, algae and other planktors that colonize the leaves and that's where they actually get the protein content but by shredding all of that they then create little spirals and eddies in the system they're invisible but they are spirals of nitrogen and phosphorus and carbon that then often are kept upstream and they don't just make a one-way shoot down a, a stream or a river all of that nitrogen and carbon and phosphorus is trapped in the system and especially with insects which emerge off the water you have to imagine 90% of those insects don't make it to finish mating. Instead, they get trapped and eaten and they become spiders and bats and bass and, you know, wood rats and sometimes people and bears. You know, if you follow the, the atoms, eventually they go further up the food web and that is then deposited back on the landscape. So anyway, shredders, pretty cool. Uh, over here, this guy, the uh, one that looks really freaky, it looks like alien kind of, that uh, is a predator. It looks like a predator. It's got sort of a shooting projectile mouth thing. This is a damselfly larva. This is um, Archelestes grandis. And this uh, damselfly kind of waits and ambushes things. That mouth shoots out um, kind of like the thing in Aliens, the thing that shoots out of its face into your face. Um, that's uh, what it uses to capture prey and bring it back to its mouth to eat. Um, over here, we've got filterers, and this is actually a beautiful image of the head of a black fly larva. Um, black fly larvae hang out suspended in the stream, and those are part of its labral fans. Those are like kind of fancy filtering mouth parts, and um, they are just filtering out fine particulate organic material as it flows past it in the stream. Uh, and then here we've got a collector gatherer. This is uh, in the genus Chimara, and this is a net spinning caddis fly. I don't have his little tent, but when they are living, they spin a little pup tent that kind of captures and collects things, uh, what we call coarse particulate organic material, little bits of leaves and, you know, tiny fly larvae and parts of dead stuff, just whatever. It's kind of a raccoon, basically. It would be a, a omnivorous animal if it collects a little tiny baby snail it doesn't go well i'm not a predator i won't eat that it'll be happy to eat that it'll eat that it'll eat pieces of leaves whatever it can find and then of course in any complex system we have parasites and um y'all might not know this even um dragonfly larvae and other bugs get their own ticks so um they really aren't ticks but they're, they're aquatic mites uh very closely related to ticks but there's all these cool little tiny things that live on these other tiny things. So there's whole ecosystems that can live on one large dragonfly. Um, you haven't lived until you've picked everything you can off of like a giant beetle or dragonfly. Um, but yeah, that's another talk for another day. So, um, you know, we collect all these invertebrates because of ecosystem complexity. The diversity in the system gives us a measure of ecosystem health. They occupy all these different feeding niches. But we also like to know sort of what's in the system because our major job, again, is we're the creek and river doctors at large. I, I could go out and sample for each of the 400,000 novel chemicals we've introduced into the environment since the 1940s, but I can't imagine finishing that in a lifetime uh, because insects and uh, other macroinvertebrates colonize habitats or can colonize habitats quickly and because they have fast life cycles sometimes we can use the communities present to have a hint and i can narrow it down to gosh maybe i'm looking for these five different types of pollution and, and that's what we use our scoring for it helps us kind of target 
what types of problems we might encounter. And some species are super intolerant to it. Uh, like these three here, I'm going to go into them in a minute. These, each of these three likes really high dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, they don't like it when there's a lot of what we call organic enrichment, i.e. sewage or uh, agricultural runoff, fertilizers, things like that. If there's a lot of nutrients in the water, that's great for bacteria, but then overnight those bacteria tend to consume all the oxygen. And um, duders like these don't, don't fare too well. Uh, so um, also I can summarize seven years of invertebrate zoology for you. You don't have to pay for all the classes. If it looks kind of fancy, it's probably fancy. <laughs> so if you see like a lot of whirly doos and whiz bangs and thingamajigs sticking off of an animal, that probably implies a very action packed high metabolism lifestyle. They're always running a marathon, always moving around quickly. And that consumes a lot of oxygen. That's why they're sensitive to depleted oxygen in the system. Uh, up here, we've got a stonefly larvae. I think it's Perlesta decipiens. Um, it becomes kind of a, a weird, uh, gosh, be closest to a grasshopper when it comes out of the water, but it's not really a grasshopper. But uh, they spend their life like this submerged. And these little frilly things around here are its gills. So again, it's fancy. Um, this is the most adorable caddisfly ever. It's uh, Coloptila. And Coloptila is a, uh, makes a tiny little case that it sort of lives in and it just likes to, it farms algae. Um, uh, and uh, that emerges as something that kind of looks like um, a boring moth. It'll look like uh, kind of a brownish moth. And if you live near a creek and you've seen a lot of tiny little brown moths around there, you may not always be seeing moths. You're probably seeing caddisflies because they look very similar. Uh, but uh, very sensitive to a lot of types of pollution and um, pretty rarely found for us in the area, actually. Uh, it's usually out in our preserve sites. And then down here, we've got some um, mayflies. And I think these are Vacuperneus pacari. I might be wrong. Might be leptohyphes. But these are mayflies. Um, mayflies are in the order of ephemeroptera. That means like ephemeral wing or winged for a day is where the name comes from. But it doesn't mean they only live for a day. They actually live for an entire year like this is sort of a crab-like thing under the water. It's just the breeding stage where they're present for just a day. But uh, we use the ratio of these intolerant species to other species to tell us as a first warning sign that we might be seeing uh, some kind of pollution. Additionally, there's a, you know, I can test for, and, you know, I can test for petroleum pollution or bacterial contamination. But one thing I cannot test for is habitat alteration. There's not like a little bottle I can shake in the water and go, oh, they've built too much in this watershed. Uh, or there's not a little bottle, I guess, actually, theoretically, there is a little bottle if you pull it out of an Antarctic ice cap. But Generally speaking, I don't have access to the chemistry that tells me about climate change, but these communities do respond over time to things like climate and habitat loss. So this gives us another way of measuring something that we can't otherwise get just through our sensors and probes and chemistry. Uh, these are some of the earliest indicators that an ecosystem is in trouble, even if the trouble is not necessarily chemical in nature or trophic in nature. So it can be... Um, you know, maybe there's too much uh, what we call impervious cover. And if you're wondering what that is, we will talk about that in just a few more slides. But if there's a lot of um, habitat change, these folks disappear too. Uh, other species are super long lived and need stability. So, you know, a lot of people know that butterflies every year kind of grow in the spring and summer's caterpillars and then become butterflies. Not all insects complete their life cycle in just one year. Some need more time. And uh, the larger dragonflies and dobson flies can take three to five years to develop into mature larvae in the water that then emerge as adults that year. And if you don't know what a dobson fly is, that's sad. It's what I call lost landscape knowledge. Other people call it the larva is usually called a helgramite. And then um, this is the uh, tusked male adult. Um, they, Your grandparents probably knew what they were. Uh, at least mine did. They they used them as fishing bait all the time. But uh, these are kind of like um, chestnut trees. So 
if you, you everybody knows that there are christmas songs about chestnuts but have you ever seen a chestnut tree ever most maybe a few of you um but most people have it well why do we have all these historical songs about them chestnut trees used to be one fourth of north america's forest so what you now think of as oaks or juniper trees were chestnut trees just a hundred years ago but the chestnut blight killed all of them so it's lost landscape knowledge you and i might sing a song as a child about them but we don't know what the organism is uh dobson flies and helgramites are one of those things that like a lot of older folks know what it is but everybody else doesn't and they are great indicators of a nice stable unpolluted stream habitat um we still do get them all over the place but just they're they're seen less often so less understood um on the right we have something that's a little more recognizable this uh dragonfly uh everybody recognizes this one the larvae is a lot uh, or nymph is a lot less recognizable to some folks and this is the same species on the top right as the species in the bottom right so it's anax junius and um that is a apex predator as a larva and as an adult they are just voracious eaters um as larvae they will eat anything they can subdue really as adults they fly around um odonate means toothed wing and um the order odonata they spend a lot of time flying around just eating constantly um but both are fairly long lived and so if you have a stream that dries up like that box culvert i showed y'all earlier well you might not find these there um because it's a you know even if the water quality is great in the year you're there if the previous year there was no water you may not find mature larvae of the longer lived species um so that helps you get a window into the past of an ecosystem um other species are uh tolerant to pollution and they can tolerate either low dissolved oxygen or they like nutrient rich habitats or they don't care because they can breathe atmospheric oxygen so each of these animals here in this slide has kind of a neat adaptation. And by the way, uh, just learning the respiration of aquatic insects alone, that's a semester course. It's fascinating. Each of these animals re-entered water at different epochs. So they all have totally different adaptations uh, for acquiring oxygen. And um, if you all think about whales, right, they have terrestrial ancestors of mammals that re-entered water aquatic insects are the same as whales and porpoises and dolphins they are not a primitive insect that hasn't fully evolved to the point where it's terrestrial all insects are derived from terrestrial ancestors these are all creatures that re-entered water to exploit new habitats and so therefore they have lots of different ways of doing that uh, on the left the water scorpion which is actually not an arachnid, count the legs, got one, two, three, four, five, six, and it has wings. Um, the water scorpion uh, uses this tail to breathe. So that tail is pushed up above the surface and it can hang suspended in any type of habitat. They usually kind of like gnarly wetlands and ponds that may have low O2, but might be full of cool worms and mosquitoes and other flies that they can eat and they grab with those claws. Uh, so if dissolved oxygen goes down overnight, it doesn't matter to this water scorpion because it, it can actually breathe or respire using oxygen from the air above. So it's not impacted by that. Um, Chematopsyche um, uh, is a net spinning caddis fly. It, um, it, it does need a pretty good amount of oxygen, but it lives in a lot of nutrient enriched streams. And that's this top right one. Um, but you can see in order to do so, its adaptation is a, a massive increase in what we call surface area to volume ratio. All those little hairs on its belly are gills. And by having a whole bunch of spindly gills, they increase the amount of surface area that's exposed for gas exchange. So even in low, you know, like somewhat low oxygen environments, they can still acquire enough oxygen for metabolism. And uh, they like to, they, you can find these like, in pretty much every creek in town. Also, you still find plenty in very clean water. Um, it's just they can live in any place. So it's not like they are like, oh, this water is not polluted. I can't live there. They'll be just as happy in Barton Creek as they will be in Waller Creek. Um, down here, I've got some physid snails. Uh, Left-handed pouch snails 
are fairly tolerant. It's probably the most common freshwater snail in our area. I think you could find them anywhere you find water in the city. If you go to a place that's a wetland or a creek and you don't see these, uh, call me because it probably means there's a spill. They can live in just about anything. You can find them in sewage effluent. You can find them in ponds. You can find them in creeks. They should be everywhere. And then this one over here, I'm saving the best for last. Uh, hopefully y'all see this red thing. If any of you has a uh, um, little betta fish pet or something, you might feed these to it. They call them blood worms when they sell them, but they're not worms. They are um, they are fly larvae for a genus of um, midges called Chironomus, and they are in the family Chironomidae, but that red is hemoglobin, and it's the same as our hemoglobin, which is cool, but uh, it's it, it, I feel like people are underwhelmed by the amazingness of this. It allows them to live in oxygen-depleted sediments, and the hemoglobin sequesters enough oxygen for them to grow, uh, but the it's convergent evolution, not divergent evolution. So it's not that we both have a common ancestor that had hemoglobin and one became flies and one became us. This is more analogous to the wings of a bat and a pterosaur and a dragonfly and a bird. All of those wings evolved independently because wings are a really great idea in this world. So hemoglobin also is, and it, it evolved independently. And it's just fascinating to like, think of if you see blood worms, Imagine shucking an oyster, and when you open it, you see a perfectly working human eyeball staring back at you. I mean, be kind of freaky, but that's how amazing it is to see that. But all of those adaptations allow each of these organisms, for one reason or another, to occupy areas where uh, oxygen levels might be a little bit lower than ideal. Um, they, they can't live without it, but they can get enough of it when oxygen levels are low. Um, so, and some of these overlap, but, um, and I don't know if y'all are gonna hear the, sorry if y'all hear the audio on this, I'm the, but uh, is that's just me talking, so it'll be me double. Um, so some uh, invertebrates just have short life cycles or colonize new habitats very quickly. So you might be sensitive to pollution or you might not, but it doesn't matter because you have a life cycle that you can breed in a week, uh, like the mosquitoes in the center here, um, the mosquitoes, you know, some species of container breeding mosquitoes, and I collected this jar of mosquitoes, by the way, in our parking garage about a week and a half after it rained. And there was a spot where the sun was hitting a rain pool in the parking garage, and there was just enough algae for these mosquitoes to live there. So, you know, if you have a 14 day breeding cycle, well, it, it doesn't really matter if you're tolerant or not to pollution, you can just be there when it's not there. You know, the, the stream may have had a catastrophic oil spill that came through one week, but, you know, six weeks later, it's fine. And and if you can pop off a generation quickly, then it won't matter. Um, likewise, the other flies that I can see that, that are here are what we call non-biting midges. And this, uh, I think I took these pictures back when everybody was watching Game of Thrones, but this is um, my like spiral of coronamid flies. These are larvae for what we see on the top right. And it kind of looks like a mosquito, but they don't bite. They're just rapid growing flies. Uh, they are the blood worms from that previous picture. So um, these blood worms here uh, become, uh, they become um, what you see on the top right here, this kind of mosquito-ish looking thing, but it doesn't bite you. They are the wildebeest of the stream. Everybody eats them. If you ever watch those nature videos where like, it's just gotta be terrible to be a wildebeest it, it literally like crocodiles and leopards and lions all eating you and your friends. That's what happens to the coronamids. They are primary consumers of algal filaments and then everybody takes a bite. So, uh, but they they produce massive numbers to uh, compensate for that, just like wildebeest do. Uh, and then in the bottom here, we've got things like the water boatman. The water boatman is just sort of a weird aberration this insect can live anywhere. It's got little, look at those little feathery legs. Two of its legs are tucked underneath, so you can only see four of its six legs. But this is something that can be anywhere at any time, all the time. So it can swim, it can fly, it can crawl. It's just, um, you know, if things are bad, it just leaves. So if there's something it doesn't like in the water, it just pops out, dries its wings, it goes somewhere else. 
So it can colonize very rapidly. They will pop into ephemeral wetlands overnight sometimes. There are mass dispersal flights in areas where we still have dark skies. They use um, reflecting moonlight off of wetlands to locate them at night and then dive in and exploit whatever food sources are there. And if things go bad, they leave. Uh, and then the water flea, which is here in the center, this um, crustacean actually requires the habitat to be ephemeral in nature. They don't do really well in rivers and lakes where there's a lot of predation by fish. They like temporary wetlands and their eggs just dry up and kind of blow around on the wind. You can find these anywhere you find temporary water habitats. So stormwater ponds, um, cow ponds that don't have fish might have them. You can find a few in creeks in the pools to the sides. And if you ever go somewhere like Enchanted Rock and it's after it's rained and there's big rain pools up there, you'll see all kinds of similar species living in those little rain pools. Um, so things with fast life cycles can kind of dodge pollution. So an overabundance of these and the absence of sensitive species usually tells us we might be looking for some type of pollution. Then we start looking at who exactly is present. Is it something that's impacted by um, organic pollution or oxygen depletion or maybe metals or something else? And it helps us kind of hone in on what we're looking for. So after, uh, and, and one of the big things that is not just something that gets poured in the water that they respond to, uh, what we call aquatic life use, which this score, all these green dots represent a, a score for combined, like our invertebrate collections, uh, combined with algae and diatoms. And generally speaking, if you look at the regression line, you know, it's a scatter plot. There's a lot of variability there. But generally, as impervious cover increases, aquatic life use decreases, including benthic macroinvertebrates, which are a part of each of those green scores. So each green dot represents a score on one or more locations for every creek you can think of in the Austin area. That's actually, it's a real, that's real data. So um, as impervious cover increases, aquatic life use decreases. And that's because impervious cover doesn't just mean habitat loss. Impervious cover also means all the nasty things that wash in when it rains. And the flashier a stream becomes, the more polluted it can become. So uh, those pictures above of a typical urban watershed you know, with high impervious cover, if we're looking at, um, I think this is Shoal. Yeah, so if we're looking at Shoal Creek here, uh, impervious cover is roads, buildings, parking lots, or compacted soil that's so compacted, rainwater won't absorb into it. And that one is actually really important because if you have high impervious cover, when rainwater washes off, it is not just polluted with the elements it picks up. It is also thermally polluted. And thermal pollution exacerbates the impacts of chemical pollutants. When rainwater can soak into the ground gradually, and I'm going to show you all a natural one. Here we have a natural hydrograph for, I think this is Bear Creek um, at FM 1826. And it's a little, these spikes show like different, this is the peaks are showing you rainstorms and the pits are showing you dry periods. But it should overall represent kind of a sigmoidal graph. This is a natural flow regime for a central Texas stream. And in a natural flow regime, you kind of have a gentle ebb and flow. That means most of the water infiltrates into the soil and then the temperature is regulated. Pollutants are usually taken up by plants, microorganisms and animals in the soil. And that kind of gently flows back to the stream over time. That's why it shows a sigmoidal graph because it doesn't all go as surface sheet flow. Some of it soaks in and becomes spring flow or seeps into the creek. Um, but with a urban watershed like Shoal Creek, you see these erratic patterns for the same rain patterns. And another thing that really stands out from that is uh, the areas where there's no data. Where there's no data, that means there's no, no flow at all. So think about that dry box culvert. In an area where you have a lot of impervious cover, when you have a rain event, you have too much all at once. And then you might have six weeks of none. And again, that just like the, you know, if we give a fish no water for a day and then give it plenty of water after that, the fish is still just as dead <laughs> at the end. So um, we, when we restore stream habitats, we kind of seek to restore the hydrograph to a more gentle sigmoidal slope instead of the erratic kind of spiky urban flashy slope. Um, 
And then one of the ways we see this, how we view this world of these invertebrates, um, is we go to, you know, typically we have three to five sites on each stream. In this, the particular year when I collected these data, I think this was 2013, 14, a bunch of sites were dry. It was one of those hot, dry years. And um, I chose these because I, I didn't want to artificially inflate the good one. I, I specifically chose one that just had two sites. So you would see I'm looking at apples to apples. Um, and in this case, we have Waller Creek on the left and Bear Creek on the right. Same year, same season, uh, same sampling technique and uh, for two locations. And the light blue things are kind of those sensitive things I showed you earlier. Remember, if it looks kind of fancy, it's fancy. Everything light blue there is fancy. Um, the green things are kind of in between. The red things are like some of those really cool things I was showing you, like the blood worms and, and water scorpions. And at the bottom, if it doesn't have a color, that means, you know what, it's a big world out there. There's a lot of invertebrates. It means I don't know what that does. Nobody does. So it's a thing. We know what it is. We don't really know what its place is in the system. Fortunately, there's only a few. But overall, you can see Bear Creek has a much greater diversity of organisms. Another thing, if you kind of focus in here, is you can see that these numbers have a, you know, there's a few things that peak, but they have a fairly even spread. There's one big peak over here for Cumatopsyche, and that's kind of normal. That's a very abundant stream insect. But overall, this is kind of even. And over here, you have much fewer taxa. And the ones you have, there's a few that dominate the entire, uh, on the left in Waller Creek, there's a few that dominate the entire community. That's what we call unevenness. And unevenness is usually a surefire sign that you've got that ecosystem's on a trajectory that has been impacted by human activities, almost always, unless we have like a massive crown wildfire or volcano or something else. Typically, we are the comet, you know, in these systems. So we're the reason the other things have disappeared from this system. Walla Creek has incredibly high impervious cover. When it rains, you have rapid temperature changes. That's not good. Uh, the analogy, when I keep talking about that thermal pollution, um, you know, you could either be running out in a pristine alpine park, you could be jogging and your breathing's probably fine. You know, you're under stress, but it's like you stress, so it's good. Uh, or what if we just put you on a treadmill in like the smokiest smoke-filled bar we could find? The same athlete in this, you know, running the same speed is going to have a much harder time in the smoky bar. Um, that's also what's happening with thermal pollution. So other pollutants that organisms might normally tolerate become harder to tolerate under the influence of the master abiotic variable, which is temperature. Um, but uh, also think about everything else that washes in, all the dog poop, all the, all the fertilizer, pesticides, spilled bleach, gasoline, leaked oil, everything comes in with those flashy rain events. If it doesn't soak into soil and get slowed down, it hits at, you know, 200 proof right into the creek and kind of nukes everything. If it has time to percolate into the soil, which happens in healthy stream systems where there's a large riparian buffer or, or wooded area and where the soil's not compacted, then you'll have less of those pollutants flowing in. So Bear Creek, we've got a lot, a lot more life and a much better even spread of life. Waller Creek, we kind of see... Um, decreases in that. And as you start to pluck little things out of the web of life, everything eventually moves. And that's what you're seeing there. And if you're on a trajectory where you have fewer and fewer species, you'll get more and more dominance by one or two species. And eventually you just have kind of a system that becomes dominated maybe by microbial life, uh, which we don't want, right? We want all of our streams to be 100% swimmable, weightable, and fishable 100% of the time. So those, even though these look different, the, we like to standardize our scores, and these are different metrics that allow us to view the invertebrate community. So again, it's very important to go to the same habitat, same season, same sample method, so that we have a true apples to apples comparison. And here we can look at different scoring metrics for Waller and Bear Creek. And if you look at the grayed out area, the ones with an asterisk are the ones that we typically um, add to our overall benthic macroinvertebrate score, that gets then combined with other scores we have for algae and diatoms, and that becomes our aquatic life use score. That aquatic life use score then 
is just one part of a much bigger EII or Environmental Integrity Index total watershed score. This includes flow regime, hydrology, chemistry, nutrients, um, the presence or absence of sediment pollutants, uh, E. coli levels, a whole lot of things go into this total score. And by getting all that information together, it allows us to kind of rank score our streams. And those of you who do live in the immediate area probably recognize the nicer creeks you like to swim in over here on the right. Um, and I think this comes from our 2013-14 data set, but the red in here is that immediate year. But remember, there's random chaos inherent in the universe. So you don't always get a perfect score. We kind of smooth that out by averaging it with historic scores so we can see more of a trend line. And the blue here represents all years combined. So it, the nice thing about that is you can kind of look at this and say, okay, so this one here for Eanes Creek, looks like maybe there was kind of a glitch that year because the red and blue don't match up. But overall, most of these reds and blues do closely matched. So you have some idea of what our accuracy and precision were in a given year when we were sampling. But here we can see 2013, 14 in red, and then historic in blue. And this then allows us to, in an unbiased way, decide where we spend all that money for retrofits and stormwater capture devices. And we, you know where are we going to spend our money and time? Well, here you've got your you know, the, the worst of the worst over here. And that's where we know we need to do the most work to improve total scores. Uh, so that's just like all of that is sort of the cumulative output of this. But again, like the macro vertebrates are just part of that. We could do a whole talk on each of those things, I suppose, uh, that goes into it. So with that, I think uh, if y'all have questions, um, go for it. Great. Um, thanks so much, Todd. I do have some questions for you. Oh, sorry. I had it turned down that whole time because I didn't. Hello. Oh, hey, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. This is, okay. I've got questions. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing some questions. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, first question, does your team sample fish populations and record them? Have you, and as a second question, part of that, have you seen platy's fish in lower Waller? <laughs> uh, so I'll do the second one first. I have definitely seen lots of platies in Waller. Uh, I've also got a collection of jars back here from weird fish kills where I'm like, why are all these aquarium fish in here? Um, but uh, for Waller Creek, the platies and mollies that are out there, I think they're sailfin mollies. Um, mm -hmm. There may be platies also. You see all these bright aquarium fish because they are very popular test subjects for genetic studies. Um, and I believe what you're seeing is the populations that have established after decades, maybe a century, of people at the end of their genetics experiment at UT or some other school throwing them out into Waller Creek. Um, because if you look at the literature, you will see they were used heavily from like the 50s through the late 80s as test subjects there. And I can imagine, I can picture, you know, you're a 22-year-old grad student, you finish your thing and you're like, well, you know, I had to kill this many to figure out what was happening here. But I don't want to just like flush these. And so I think people just threw them out there and they have established fairly well. There's also a lot of aquarium throwouts in Waller Creek. Um, that I have found goldfish that are about, I think I've, the biggest ones are about nine inches. Um, just, I don't mean koi. I mean like the little ones that people used to win at carnivals and fairs, but they're like that. And uh, I went out for a fish kill all of the bluegill and minnows and gambusia, the native fish, were all still alive. But there were hundreds of goldfish. And we were just racking our brains trying to figure out what, you know, horrible new horribleness have we found. You know, it's like we were like, this is going to be the next COVID. <laughs> but um, we see all these dead fish. We're trying to figure out what happened and why it only killed one type of fish. And then I looked at the weather. And the weather the day before was one of those, it had been warm for like three weeks. And then all of a sudden we have one of those cold snaps where it dropped to, you know, 20 degrees for 48 hours. And it killed the fish that weren't from the area, but left the native fish alive. Um, but anyway, the platy population does fairly well in Waller Creek. I, 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 we could talk about that for hours. Like why? why? People can't keep those alive to... to Think about how much money people spend trying to keep their pet fish alive. 
but these are living in Waller Creek. So for any entrepreneurs out there, maybe you should go catch some of those and sell those to people for their aquariums. Um, what was the first part of the Waller question? Sorry, I get excited about the weird <laughs> fish in Waller. That's great. The first one was, um, just your team sample fish populations and record them. Uh, not routinely. We are considering now we, we're, um, about to start using something called environmental DNA sampling. Uh, we've be, it, we have not had the resources or staff time to do what we would call routine electroshocking surveys or routine fish surveys. Um, we do want that information because uh, that, I guess the analogy I would say, fish and larger animals respond to years of ecosystem change. Aquatic insects and mollusks and crustaceans, your macroinvertebrates respond to the last uh, six months to two years of change, and then algae respond to the last three, three or four weeks of change. We would love to have that longer term measure, but currently haven't had it. Uh, we're going to start collecting. Um, we want to get the DNA signature of all the species in the area. We're hoping that we can go out and collect bottles of water and then collect what's called environmental DNA, which is just what's being shed off of those species and detect their presence or absence. But up until now, no. However, we do special studies. Occasionally, we are asked to move a bunch of fish because there's construction happening that impacts the stream. Uh, if our um, if our restoration engineers have to stop flow somewhere like they did in Pease Park a few years ago when the road was collapsing, um, then we go out and collect them all. And I mean, we moved something like 20,000 fish. It, it was incredible how much we moved with coolers. And there's a whole process and you have to do permitting through um, Parks and Wildlife to move fish around even in the same watershed. But we did it, uh, caught them, put them in coolers. We even counted the species and how many we saw surviving when we moved them. Because, you know, when you move a bunch of fish in a cooler, there's going to be a few that don't make it through that process. But we had like 96% survival rate, at least on day one, and um, moved those fish out of the way before they dewatered. So we have like intermittent fish data. And then our limnologist, Brent Bellinger, uh, I think he at least attends whenever parks and wildlife are surveying fish on our reservoirs. So we have some feel for those. But again, we don't have year to year data and it is definitely something we're interested in pursuing in the future. At least it's something I have been personally pushing for. Great. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. This person found a mite that has an extra bump. Um, they knew it was a mite, but I've never seen one like that and Googled it and it said it was a male. Um, have you ever encountered seeing a mite with a bump like that? Like what? You oh, this is one of my favorite games. So without <laughs> seeing it, um, I do this with my nieces and nephews a lot. And I, I used to just get blurry photos for any biologists out there. Y'all probably know this. Your family sends you like blurry photos all the time says, what is this? And you're like, ah, Bigfoot. I don't know. But um, now, after like a decade and a half of doing that, I like to say, don't send me the picture, describe it to me, tell me what it was doing when you found it. And I think I'm getting like, I can do like maybe three out of 10 times I get it right. So I'm going to see if I get this right. There is a, it, was it in the water? Oh, shoot. If, if, it, if, it, if it was in the water and it, if it's turquoise blue and it appears to have two segments, which mites don't, they have one fused cephalothorax and abdomen hmm. um it's what makes them mites and uh like okay but quick lesson here insects have how many people you've got a head thorax abdomen right arachnids like spiders have a cephalothorax their thorax and head are fused and an abdomen mites have the whole thing is kind of fused <laughs> so they're weird um but this mite has there is a little tiny water mite that is kind of turquoise green and i think it might be all of one and a half millimeters that is the only one I've encountered like that. And I don't know, I may have. Todd, you're, I was just going to give you feedback from the person asking the question. Yes, it was blue. So in water and blue, you, you got both. We're going to see if I can pull this off really quick. I have like a catalog of all life in our creeks that I've been collecting and go to my water mites photos and see if I have one in there. I don't know if I've got one of the blue ones in here. Bummer. Um, uh, while you're looking, I mean, I know this is like a lot of like a juggling at once, but
but I have, oh, look at that. And you'll see, this is uh, my collection of water mite photos. <laughs> this is Todd's water mite photography. Look at that one. Isn't that one crazy? Um, and I, there is one that looks a lot like that, that is turquoise blue, and it does appear to have like an extra part sticking off of it. I do not know the species. I don't even know the genus. But uh, water, yeah, this is, I'm just right now, like kind of ad hoc uh, going, oh, here we go. So did it look like this, but blue? Can y'all see my cursor going around it? Yes, the person said they used a microscope and it's very tiny. Yes, like that, but blue. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell them to send me a photo if they can. If they, you, you can sometimes get your iPhone up to one of the ocular lenses of a microscope and get a decent photo. Have them send in a photo like this and we'll see if we can send it to a mite person. That's why I have personally been collecting these and these are not random. I am very purposefully getting ventral, dorsal, and profile pictures so that I can find out more about our mites. Oh, there you go. There's your turquoise mite. Is that it? <laughs> if that's it, then I I don't know. You owe me ice cream. <laughs> if I guessed it from just hearing about it. Is that does that look like your mite? I think we're all I'll be we'll so see, happy. We'll see what the end. That would be incredible. Like a yeah. like a so. webinar magic trick. Yes, that's that's the mic. <laughs> yes. is, I'm still good at this. Wow, cool. Um, so yeah, there's uh there's one of our mites. Now I can't move the picture. Weird. Oh, let's do that. Let me close it. Well, we can like incredible. I mean, I want to end on that because that's impressive, but we have a couple more questions in a few more okay. minutes. Can we can we keep going? Sure. Okay, great. Um, do y'all find stonefly larvae east of 35? And if so, um, yes. any particular season? Um, uh, typically in Texas, you find stoneflies in uh, like midwinter to mid spring. It's because they are, they are cold water species here in general. And I'll show y'all some pictures. You know what? We could just keep going with this picture thing. I'll just uh, jump to my stoneflies photos. Um, there is one species that we get. There we go. Sorry, bear with me. Um, here we go. So there's a Perlesta decipiens, and uh, we get a few of these duders in, into very early spring is when they start to disappear. It is because they have um, high O2 requirements. There's There's the gills on it. They don't have as many, uh, they have a lower surface area to volume ratio compared to mayflies and caddisflies because their gills are a little simpler. And um, here's an adult, um, Luca Trichia, I think. I'm in a meeting, so I'm just letting you know. Um, sorry. Uh, this is an adult Luca Trichia hittii, I think. Um, this These also are only present. I only find the larva. I don't even know if I have good pictures of the larva of these. I only find the larva in... Uh, midwinter, but colder water has more oxygen dissolved in it. So these can thrive at this latitude in Texas during the winter. If you go further north, once you're up into like the like Colorado and for, or anywhere alpine, you find tons of stoneflies. They're usually one of the dominant organisms. Anywhere north of Oklahoma, any river system north of there, there are innumerable species. In the Austin area, I only get maybe eight or nine species, uh, but that's really special when we find them. They are uh, super sensitive to um, water, like watersheds that have been developed because of that thermal pollution and the lack of oxygen. So um, yeah, we generally get them from December through, you might get a few in mid-May. Thank you, Todd. Great presentation. Um, we have a lot of good feedback and um, wanted to say thanks. All right, cool. thanks everyone. Bye.